In the year 30 AD, a man named Jesus was crucified in the city of Jerusalem. This event of this man is a pivotal part of Christian belief, documented extensively in the Bible or New Testament. It covers Jesus' life from his birth to the crucifixion and his ascension, all of which are believed to be prophesied in the Old Testament before his arrival on earth and also in the Quran. However, there is controversy surrounding whether Jesus truly resurrected from the dead or not. Some argue that his body was stolen by his disciples and that he lived on, marrying Mary Magdalene. But how true are these things? Did Jesus resurrect and ascend unto heaven? Is there any historical evidence of his resurrection? Well, let's delve into these topics and see what really happened on the third day, which is not popularly shared. Don't forget to subscribe for more intriguing content like this one and support us by liking the video. Now let's delve into the details of this event. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you. You have no part with me then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why, he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example, that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said to ask him which one he meant. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do it quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy 
what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. After Judas took the bread, he left, and it was nighttime. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks. Then he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. After that, he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Jesus told them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along. He began to feel very sad and troubled. Jesus said, My soul is filled with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came back and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, Couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away and prayed the same thing again. When he returned, he found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and prayed the same thing a third time. Then he came back and said to them, Are you still sleeping? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with a large crowd armed with swords and clubs. They were sent by the chief priests and elders of the people. The betrayer had arranged a signal with them, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. So Judas went up to Jesus, greeted him, saying, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. One of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. But Jesus said, Put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, that say it must happen in this way? Addressing the crowd, Jesus said, Am I leading a rebellion, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. The men who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I can destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, You have said so, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He is worthy of death. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophecy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Meanwhile, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all.
I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him, and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans on how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the thirty pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting in the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. 
When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes. By casting lots and sitting down, they kept watch over him. There above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. On that same day, two travelers were journeying to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were engaged in conversation, discussing all the recent events. As they walked and talked, Jesus himself approached and joined them on the road, yet they were unable to recognize him. He inquired about their conversation, and they stopped, their faces filled with sorrow. One of them, 
named Cleophas, responded, expressing surprise that the stranger seemed unaware of the recent events surrounding Jesus of Nazareth. They recounted how Jesus, whom they believed to be a prophet mighty in word and deed, had been handed over to death by the religious authorities and crucified. Though they had hoped he would be the Redeemer of Israel, their hopes were dashed when they found the tomb empty on the third day after his death. Some women claimed to have seen angels who declared Jesus alive, but when others went to verify, they found the tomb empty as well. Jesus then rebuked them for their lack of understanding and belief in what the prophets had foretold about the Messiah's suffering and eventual glory. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them the significance of these events in light of Scripture. As they approached their destination, Jesus appeared to be continuing on, but they insisted that he stay with them as evening was approaching. So, he agreed to stay and joined them at the table. While breaking bread, Jesus blessed it and gave it to them, at which point their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Suddenly, he vanished from their sight. Overwhelmed with emotion, they exclaimed to each other how their hearts had burned within them as Jesus had spoken to them along the road and revealed the scriptures to them. Immediately, they returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered, who confirmed that the Lord had indeed risen and had appeared to Simon Peter too. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me, and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Now hear this, let no one deceive you. Historical evidence supports the resurrection of Jesus challenging skeptics to take it seriously. This argument rests on four main points. Jesus' death and burial, the empty tomb, the belief of the apostles, and the conversion of Paul. Jesus' death and burial are widely accepted by contemporary historians with virtually unanimous consensus. The crucifixion of Jesus is extensively documented in historical records, both Christian and non-Christian including the New Testament books, such as the Gospels, Acts, Paul's letters, Hebrews, 1 Peter, and Revelation. References to Jesus' crucifixion also appear in writings by non-Christian authors like Josephus and Tacitus, as well as in apocryphal Gospels and early Christian texts like Shreclement and the epistles of Barnabas and Polycarp. The idea of a crucified Messiah would have been deeply offensive to first-century Jews, making it highly unlikely that early Christians would have fabricated such a story. Scholars like Bart Ehrman and Gerd Ludemann affirm the indisputable fact of Jesus' death by crucifixion. 
The historicity of Jesus' burial is also supported by multiple attestations, as it is recorded in all four Gospels and explicitly mentioned in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The involvement of Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent figure and member of the Sanhedrin, in Jesus' burial further strengthens its credibility. Given these historical facts, the question arises, what happened to Jesus after his death and burial? Additionally, the New Testament Gospels assert that Jesus' tomb was discovered empty on the Sunday following his crucifixion. While this claim is not universally accepted, a recent survey of academic literature spanning three decades indicates that a majority of scholars who wrote on the subject acknowledge it. The strongest evidence supporting the historicity of the empty tomb is the report that it was first found by women. This detail, though seemingly insignificant, carries weight considering the low status of women in the first century. If early Christians were fabricating narratives, they would likely have attributed the discovery of the tomb to more credible witnesses. Jewish New Testament scholar Geza Vermes reflects on this evidence, concluding that despite differing interpretations, the undeniable fact remains. The women discovered an empty tomb when they went to pay their respects to Jesus. Vermes acknowledges the strength of the women's testimony, even though he does not defend the resurrection itself. Another factor supporting the historicity of the empty tomb is the timing of the Apostles' proclamation of the resurrection, beginning just seven weeks after Jesus' death in Jerusalem. Had Jesus still been in the tomb, his body would have been recognizable, making it difficult to sustain the burgeoning Christian movement in the face of opposition. Yet Christianity flourished in the very city where Jesus was buried, suggesting that the tomb was indeed empty. Moreover, Matthew's Gospel recounts a dialogue between Christians and Jews regarding the body of Jesus, indicating that even opponents believed the tomb was empty. The accusation of grave robbery by Jewish leaders implies their acknowledgement of the empty tomb. Most skeptical responses to the resurrection do not outright dismiss the empty tomb as a legend, but seek alternative explanations for it. Regarding the belief of the apostles, followers of Jesus claim to have seen him alive after his execution their accounts describe multiple encounters with Jesus over several weeks, involving not only visions, but physical interactions, such as touching, talking, and sharing meals. These experiences were not isolated, but involved large groups, including 500 individuals at one time. Historians widely agree that the disciples genuinely believed they had encountered the risen Jesus, even if they might have been mistaken. Despite differing views on the resurrection's historicity, scholars like Gerd Ludemann acknowledge that Peter and the disciples had post-death experiences with Jesus as the risen Christ. The persecution endured by the apostles further supports their sincerity, with historical evidence of their suffering and martyrdom for their faith. It's challenging to argue that they knowingly propagated falsehoods given the risks they faced. Drawing a parallel, it's reasonable to infer the Apostles' sincerity, akin to terrorists who commit atrocities for their beliefs. Just as terrorists sincerely act on their convictions, despite the consequences, the Apostles had little to gain and much to lose by promoting a fabricated story. Unlike the terrorists, however, the Apostles were in a unique position to verify the truth of their claims, having personally interacted with Jesus shortly after his execution. If their accounts were fabricated, they would have known it to be false and not worth dying for. Reza Aslan, despite his stance that the exact events after Jesus' death are unknowable, acknowledges the significance of the Apostles' steadfastness. He points out the remarkable fact that they faced persecution and death without recanting their testimony, suggesting a genuine belief in encountering the risen Jesus. The Apostles' unwavering commitment to their claims, even in the face of adversity, supports the notion that they genuinely believed in the resurrection, regardless of its factual accuracy. The conversion of Paul, reported in the Book of Acts and his New Testament letters, is a crucial piece of evidence. Paul, originally 
a fierce opponent of the church, had actively persecuted early Christians, even consenting to the stoning of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. However, while on his way to Damascus to continue his persecution, Paul experienced a sudden conversion, claiming to have encountered Jesus on the road. Unlike the other apostles, Paul was not a follower of Jesus during his ministry and was hostile to the early church. Thus, his testimony is considered that of a hostile witness, as he had no incentive to accept Christian beliefs unless he had a genuine experience confirming Jesus' resurrection. Paul's conversion immediately placed him at odds with Jewish religious leaders in every city he visited. He endured physical hardships, as detailed in his second letter to the Corinthians, including beatings, stonings, and shipwrecks, due to his faith. More significantly, his conversion had profound spiritual implications. As a Pharisee, Paul had vehemently opposed the claims of Jesus' followers, considering them blasphemous. Yet, within days, he underwent a radical religious transformation, embracing Jesus as the unique Son of God and the Savior of humanity. Paul's conversion is psychologically surprising, akin to a vocal atheist like Richard Dawkins suddenly becoming a devout Christian. The unexpectedness of such a complete reversal underscores the extraordinary nature of Paul's experience. Moreover, Paul's acceptance of a despised and persecuted religious sect, rather than a widely accepted world religion, adds to the astonishment of his conversion. Therefore, skeptics of the resurrection must provide a plausible explanation for why Paul underwent such a dramatic conversion in such a short period of time. Some skeptics propose that Jesus' disciples stole his body from the tomb to perpetuate the belief in his resurrection. This theory suggests that the disciples fabricated the resurrection story to maintain their influence and authority after Jesus' death. However, this theory faces challenges in explaining how the heavily guarded tomb could be accessed and the body removed without detection. Another theory posits that someone else was crucified in Jesus' place, while he either escaped or was rescued. Proponents of this theory argue that Jesus survived the crucifixion and later lived in secret. However, this theory contradicts historical accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and lacks substantial evidence to support its claims. Some alternative theories suggest that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and had children with her. This concept gained widespread attention with the publication of Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code. Proponents of this theory point to ancient texts and Gnostic writings that depict Mary Magdalene as a close companion of Jesus. However, Mainstream scholars largely dismiss these claims due to the lack of credible historical evidence. These theories often emerge from a desire to challenge traditional religious narratives and explore alternative interpretations of historical events. While they may generate intrigue and debate, they typically lack robust evidence and scholarly consensus. Mainstream historians and theologians generally uphold the traditional accounts of Jesus' life crucifixion and resurrection based on available historical records and textual evidence. Now, do you believe Jesus was resurrected or not? Let us know by commenting on his video. Thanks for watching.